Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, and welcome to an episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Today's guest is Robin Burkell from the DC area. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist with over 25 years of experience. She has dealt with populations ranging in socio-demographic from inner city all the way up. And we are gonna be talking today about trauma. Thank you for joining today, Robin. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk more about trauma as always. So for our guests who may or may not be familiar with the buds words of trauma and trauma informed, can you start teasing that out and talk about what actually is considered trauma and are there gradations of trauma? Yes and yes. Um, so the idea is that trauma can be an event. It can be something specific that occurred. It can also be the residue that is left on your body, that is left over from something traumatic that has happened and the feelings that are still there, that are still present. Um, trauma can happen to anyone and trauma is subjective. It is not always objective. So some people think of specific events as traumatic, like someone going to war versus an emotional trauma, so an attachment wound. So trauma can run the gamut of um, anything from what I think is traumatic to what you think is traumatic to what anyone does. So what, however it impacts them. So how is trauma processed in the brain and in the body? Because if it is a subjective experience, there must be some symptoms that actually show, right? Symptoms that show after the fact? Is that what you're yes. asking? Or, yes. um, right? Because trauma happens when the processing of an event gets stuck in the brain. So when someone gets stuck in fight, flight, freeze, when their brain gets stuck and the trauma does not fully process through so that they get to safety, they get to repair. Um, and the symptoms that can show up can be just about anything. Most trauma survivors show something that looks like hypervigilance or what we call hypoarousal. So hypervigilance is right they pay attention they notice every detail imaginable because they're always watching and hypo arousal is they've kind of checked out um, and they're not they're not paying attention to the details they're just sort of surviving and trauma survivors survive they, that's how they make it through um, and use whatever coping skills and survival skills they need so when we think about that big T definition of trauma, that singular event, that's, you know, in our vernacular, that's how we like to think of trauma. You know, it, it's something that happened to somebody and not something endured or lived or even a flavor of. When I work with families who have a loved one who struggles with a substance use disorder or other form of symptom that may be trauma based, Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. tend to work with those people to tease out the trauma from just the behavior? So I think it's it can be really complex. I think the, the biggest piece is I don't believe that anyone uses to get to a point of addiction without some underlying reason, right? It's no longer fun to be using. It's no longer glorious or even with friends, right? It becomes this, this event that they have to endure to be able to survive life. So 
from my vantage point, I work with, when I work with addiction, when I work with trauma, I'm always working from a three-stage trauma model, which is safety and stabilization first. So that looks like helping our clients be safe, helping them feel stabilized, right? Um, so that might mean treatment, that might mean some harm reduction, that might mean um, not using, it might be going to meetings, et cetera. And then after the safety and stabilization in current day life, then we can look at what's been going on that someone is using to feel less or feel less badly. Most who are struggling with substance use or alcohol use disorders or any of what I call the dissociative mechanisms. Um, what that is, is someone who really just can't be present in the feelings. They're doing something to try and um, not feel or not feel as badly. All of those pieces have to be addressed for safety and then we can address for what's underlying that, right? What is, what's, what's the reasoning behind having these feelings that they, they are struggling to manage? So when I think of the families again, do they experience sort of trauma alongside those people who have experienced the trauma? Is it singular to the person who had the event or lived those things or does it impact the whole entire family? So generally speaking, it impacts the entire family because no one person in a family exists in a glass bubble. Um, it affects all of them. It affects them maybe in different ways, whether the trauma event or events impact them or the traumatic events of watching their loved one struggle, right? So there's definitely trauma. There can be powerlessness, a lot of fear that happens for all members of the family. Sometimes I have observed that the family members seem to actually exhibit more emotional dysregulation, more physical mm -hmm. symptoms than the person who is actually using some dissociative technique as a way of coping. It's the other members of that constellation that seem to be acting out. Well, it's interesting. I wonder what you mean by acting out with regard to this because I think, right, you may see more of it with family members because they're not using something to dissociate from those feelings. Maybe they're present in them, so you're seeing the raw emotion versus someone who's, who is using, who's getting high, who's getting drunk, right, who is doing anything they can to not feel. Yeah. And how does that impact the body? when we're doing those things separate from the effects of the substances themselves. When we're healing from trauma, what is that mind-body connection? Because there is one, I know that. So I think there's that mind-body connection always, right? I don't think that we can ever separate. So sometimes trauma lives in the mind as far as having a narrative. And sometimes it lives in what we call lives on the body because there's no narrative. There's just symptoms of trauma, right? We can see that... Um, we can see what's happening and it's showing us trauma symptoms even if there is no narrative. Sometimes the symptoms happen way before the narrative. Interesting. So it's as if you can see the windows open, the door is there, your jewelry is missing, but you didn't see the robber so you don't know what actually happened. Right, exactly. That's exactly it, right? You, you feel it, you know in that scenario, maybe you've been violated or betrayed, something terrible has happened, and you don't know what it is, you don't know what the narrative is. So in our field, we often hear words like personality disorders in accompaniment to substance use disorders. What is your sort of trauma-informed lens looking at personality disorders? How would you view those? So I very much um, despise the terms of personality disorders. I think they are 
mostly all trauma-based, right? You have trauma survivors who are doing anything they can to survive. And so that might look like cutting you off before you cut me off, right? It might look like trying to inflate my ego. It might look like personality disorders, quote unquote, um, but really it's trauma-based issues. It's survival, right? I believe that trauma survivors have protective parts of themselves that will do anything they can to survive, um, to survive their scenarios, to, right, to not crawl up into a ball and no longer exist. And so the idea that they will do extreme measures makes total sense to me. I actually wrote an entire article on why I I despise the, <laughs> the terms. <laughs> I believe that I believe in the goodness of people and that people are are born um, wonderful and sometimes life happens and they have to you know develop sort of adaptive or maladaptive coping skills to that. Don't we all, in some ways? We do, we do, and for those without trauma, we tend to bounce back, right? We tend to be able mm. to recover what we as therapists call re-regulate our emotions. We are able to say that, um, that we can be in what I call the window of tolerance, right? Um, and that's tolerating emotions. And we can experience a lot of hardship in that. For a lot of trauma survivors, their, their window of tolerance is fairly narrow. And so everything feels huge. And so they need to cope, survive, adapt to more and more things every day. So in essence, what you may be doing is really broadening that window of tolerance in those early sessions so that oh, somebody right. is comfortable. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that right. would Building be the... safety, right? Building safety in the relationship with a therapist, right? And that includes, right, understanding that their behaviors make sense given their history, right? trauma survivors do what they can, right? They're not doing bad things. They are not bad people. They are trying to survive. And if we can really embrace that and teach our clients to embrace that, right? Then that gives them an opening for healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. So, with families who have abundant resources, there is this expectation that th bad things don't happen to them or they're not going to experience trauma. Can you puncture that myth? I can. Um, that would be lovely, right, if that were true, if there was some way in which you could guarantee bad things wouldn't happen based on your religious observance, where you live, your educational components, your 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 financial stability, etc. Trauma happens to everyone, right? My practice outside of DC consists of almost a hundred percent of clients who are at minimum college educated, right? They likely have advanced degrees, are financially stable, and, and trauma still happens. It does not discriminate based on socioeconomic status. It does not um, discriminate based on religion, where you live, if you live in a big city versus a small town. Um, trauma hits everyone and and we have to be aware that that trauma is also a felt experience by the person who feels it so not everyone has to agree that it is quote unquote trauma um, someone has to feel right a perceived sense of lack of safety lack of stability right they have to feel scared that's what makes an event traumatic or could make an event traumatic for them so the midwestern lift yourself up by the bootstraps ignore the things that happen to you i would imagine goes counter to what you're 
really suggesting here, right? Yes, very much so, right? I believe in grace and compassion, right? Really understanding, making sure that our clients are nurturing themselves, especially if they didn't get that in the way that they needed when they were younger, right? That, that there is no pulling yourself up by your bootstraps because in my opinion, that is a survival mechanism, right? That's, that's some level of dissociation. And in order to do that, you have to ignore what's happening for you on the inside. And a lot of my clients, right, when they first start work with me, they, they don't know what's happening on the inside. When I ask them that, when I ask them how they feel, they say, right, things like, fine, I don't know, right? What should I feel? Mm -hmm. I just, like, like, let's just make some space for, for you to notice whatever you feel, no judgment, right? It, it's okay. How terrifying for some people who have not been raised in environments where feelings were talked about, accepted, or mm -hmm. at least the less desirable feelings, I should say, you know? Right, right. Sad, scared, right? Like in lots of families, vulnerable. those are not okay. Yeah. Vulnerable, forget that one, right? Like mm -hmm. that's that's not always okay at all, especially for a lot of our clients, right? That vulnerable for them feels even more unsafe because they feel like they can try and control safety on some level. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me too. Do you have a story of somebody you've worked with over the years that is just a story of resilience that you bring to yourself when you start feeling like, do I make an impact in this world? Who, who comes to mind for you? Gosh, I have so many. I am so lucky. I have so many of those stories. Um, I would say one of my earliest stories was um, a young teen I worked with who um, was really struggling with her addiction from very early on. Lots of trauma in her history. And um, I still hear from her every, every year I get a holiday card and I hear about how great she's doing. And so that brings a smile to my face. 100%. We talk about resilience studies and it can be really short interactions. It can be really long interactions, but we don't know whether we're that person somewhere in a moment where we have helped somebody's resilience. Yeah, I think everyone is somebody in those moments, right? Every bit of kindness, every smile as you walk down the street, every niceness, right? That I think that we all build in that resilience for everyone. Recently, I've seen around our area, there are signs uh, hung by who knows, I don't know who, um, on telephone poles, and they say things like empathy or kindness, right, sensitivity. And each time I drive by one of those those signs, I think, oh, right, that, that's right. awesome. And that's feeding me. Whoever that person is, is feeding me. I love that. So to finish our conversation, what are some of the techniques you suggest or even use to move out of that place of spinning and into a more healthy regulated space? So I think it really depends on the client. I think, um, right, clearly finding some safe space, some therapist who can help you create that safe space where um, clients can feel safe, feel trusted, feel without judgment. Um, I think those are super helpful. I think the idea of right figuring out what clients are using to survive and can we insert a few other healthy pieces for them, right? Can we help them develop some other coping skills that might not be so self-harming to them? I think that is so huge. I think, right, also for the families, the idea of helping them understand that um, 
they're not being shamed also they're not being blamed mm -hmm. that everyone is usually trying to do their best it's just sometimes the best that you have doesn't work for everyone and needs needs a little help so i think just approaching life with compassion almost saying having everyone say to themselves what they would say to their best friend um, could be a really great start, right? There's lots of avenues to go down with regard to therapists and, and, and trauma treatment and understanding it from my vantage point that we can't treat addiction without treating trauma. Old school treatment was you have to get sober before you can touch any of the other pieces. Well, you can't get sober if you're not addressing what's underlying and making you want to use all the time, right? Because you can't tolerate those emotions. So we have to do that a bit at the same time. So when I think about a residential treatment program, what they really are great for in your sort of rubric, if I'm if I'm saying, would be in that stabilization phase, in that place where they need containment and their emotions are all over the place, they might need detox, and then the real work begins. But that isn't the, that's, that's the, that's addressing a maladaptive coping strategy or perhaps an adaptive coping strategy, but the, mm -hmm. the real work is in the years following that and the replacement work that has to happen. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. I say that the first right 30, 60, 90 day programs, they help with the safety and the stabilization so that we can do the rest of the work. Right. So, Robin, thank you for spending this half an hour with me. Is there anything else that you would like us to know before we close? Uh, I'm sure there are so many things. I think the biggest thing that I'd like to end with is compassion for all involved and everybody is just trying their best. I love that. Thank you for that message. And if you've liked this episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast, please like us on your platform of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.